So there's a number of my students who are out here tonight, and the check's in the mail. I appreciate your attendance. Uh, the topic of tonight's presentation is uh, the intellectual life or the life of the mind as friendship with God. And it's a topic that I've thought a lot about over the last year. And it came out of a conference I attended at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, on the notions of friendship. But one of the things that has kind of struck me in the way in which I've thought about these things is that from my own initial experience, when I went back to graduate school, I was getting long in the tooth. And like I suspect a number of you, my undergraduate days were less than sterling. And I hadn't really found anything that struck me with any kind of significant passion. So I found myself at Gonzaga University in Spokane beginning to do studies in philosophy. The experience I had there is one of those kinds of experiences that stayed with me and finally began to, as it were, kind of blossom in terms of helping me to think about this topic. And the reason is that it was the first experience I had in studies that I literally fell in love with something. The passion that I had for philosophy, it was obscene, actually. Uh, my friends didn't want to talk to me because that's all I wanted to talk about. Uh, as I look back now, I was pretty obnoxious. But it was a very powerful experience, and, uh, and that experience then forced me to begin to kind of reflect on what really was going on in that encounter in studies. So tonight's presentation is a combination of two things. It's a something of an academic presentation, and since there's a context, I think, needs to be stated in terms of talking about this topic. But it's also personal reflection on how I think about these things in terms of my own life here at BC, the work I do, and the work I do with my students. So there's kind of three parts to tonight's presentation. First will be, again, a historical uh, situating ourselves historically. What's the problem in terms of how to think about the intellectual life as friendship with God? The second, and most of my students here, well, this will sound familiar, I'm going to talk a little bit about what friendship really means. And then the third part will be to try and talk more specifically about how we can think about the life of the mind as friendship with God. Again, this is preaching to the choir for some of you. <clears throat> we find ourselves as men and women in the 21st century having inherited an intellectual tradition that prizes a sense of autonomy. It prizes a sense of a kind of self-sovereignty. I'm the master of my own domain. Pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I'm a self-made man. The emphasis on this kind of individualism, which has its upsides, but it also has its dark sides. And one of the dark sides of this is that it's associated with a certain turn that took place philosophically in the, uh, what we call it the rise of modernity. The way in which human reason seems to be more of an instrument to figure out how to get what we want. Instead of understanding human reason as something that orients us to something greater than ourselves. So I suspect most of you have done your philosophy and you've read Plato and Aristotle and Augustine and Aquinas. And for the ancients, they understood this kind of erotic desire as a desire to be in union with something greater than themselves. To be in union with, for Plato, the good, for Augustine and Aquinas, to be in union with God. For Aristotle, it was the contemplative life, which somehow was a divine life. So it was the way in which reason, this eros that we have, this erotic desire to know the true, the good, and the holy, moved us outside of ourselves to seek something greater than ourselves. But as I just mentioned, historically, we find ourselves thinking about reason in a much thinner context, that it tends to be associated with kind of a pragmatic approach to how to get things done. We've lost a certain kind of transcendent quality to the understanding of reason. And coupled with this is, again, this kind of notion of self-sovereignty that comes out of John Locke, who was certainly very influential in the uh, intellectual formation of our own republic. The emphasis on the unencumbered self, we're not tied to anything greater than myself. It's my needs and my desires that seem to dominate. 
In this kind of situation, what happens is, is that our own religious experience becomes completely internalized. It becomes a private spirituality that seems to be severed from any kind of context whereby we'd have a conversation about what it is that I believe. It seems to be sufficient enough to say that this is my private spirituality. What I like to kind of argue is that if we take the life of the mind seriously, it really moves us beyond a much more compact way of thinking about our own religious commitments. The overall effects of the shift in reason, this notion of the sovereignty of the self, is really to kind of produce an approach to the intellectual life that is religiously tone deaf. We don't think about what we do in school or the books that we read or the things that we're passionate about as opportunities to encounter God. Now, in terms of the friendship issue, Cicero tells us that friendship is vital for any kind of human life. That to have friends, to love friends, is to have people in your life that you can share what's most important in your life with them. To have friends is to have those kinds of people with whom you can count on, that can bring the best out of you, that can help you see and understand yourself in a much richer way. Aristotle tells us, count yourself lucky if you've got five good friends in the true sense of that term. Because friendships are those kinds of relationships that indeed can set a context for a much richer way of thinking about who I am and what I want to be. When we think about friendships, it's important to think about the fact that we are, to borrow a uh, term from a contemporary philosopher, Charles Taylor, we are dialogical beings. That is, we are men and women meant for conversation. Conversation about, as I tell my students, high things. And it's in the context of the conversation in friendship that we come to discover more about who we are, what are my gifts and talents, what sort of things should I really be thinking about, and how my life ought to unfold. So friendship in a conversational sense is the kinds of relationships that are vital, again, to round out a sense of who and what we are and why we're doing what we're doing. Friendship is that paramount exercise where we're willing to place our life in the hands of someone else. We become friends with someone to the extent that there is something good that attracts each of us in friendship. That there is a goal. That there's something significant. There's something there that binds us together to help us, again, get out of ourselves, and this is going to take place again in a kind of conversational activity. So for Aristotle, not only is the excellent life a contemplative life, but the excellent life is a life in friendship around what really is truly good. Friendships are the training schools for virtues. How to think and how to act nobly. Now, much of this you probably have already heard in class, one way or another. So the next question is, what then is friendship with God, and how do I think about that in terms of my own intellectual life? Friendship with God is made possible by the mysterious elevation of our minds and hearts through what we call grace. Grace is God's conversation with us in friendship. It is God's desire to communicate God's self to us in a profound and significant way. In the Christian tradition, we understand this as the interpersonal relationships between Father, Son, and Spirit being communicated to us in acts of friendship. It is infinite love that is being communicated to us. And this love, being communicated to us in grace, ought to transform our hearts. Not only our hearts, but it also transforms our mind. To the extent that we become men and women 
whose very being becomes a dynamic orientation in love. It is a love that brings us out of ourselves again to discover what's best about us. The grace of God's friendship in our life automatically places us in a conversation that we can call the mystical body. It is that great conversation that began when God first revealed himself to the Hebrew people, and that conversation continued with, from the Christian perspective in the Incarnation through the saints and all the great men and women who still walk among us. It is the communication of God's love in this context that says a lot about how we can think about our lives, and particularly our lives as intellectuals. More specifically, this experience of grace transforms the whole of us, the biological, the psychological, and the intellectual. It transforms us in such a way that all of us, or the totality of what we are, gets reordered. Our intellectual operations then shift in terms of understanding that now what we're engaged in is somehow trying to discover who God is in my life through the various things that I'm doing intellectually. So the effects of this being in love, this dynamic orientation that we have, is experienced in our own illuminations of our understanding. So I go back to that experience that I had in philosophy in Gonzaga. <clears throat> As I began to think more and more about that, one of the things that became, at least for me anyway, quite clear is that my experience of falling in love with this particular kind of discipline was the experience of falling in love with God. Falling in love with God because of the illumination of my own self-understanding, the illumination and the presentation of the questions that began to arise in me through this work, and other sorts of uh, uh, effects that came out of that. So to think about this experience of being in love with God is to understand that in terms of our own intellectual life, we can have this tremendous experience whereby our understanding becomes enriched, becomes expanded, and we begin to start seeing things anew and understanding things in a new way. From the Christian perspective, it is it is specifically in the love of Christ and Christ's willingness to share his knowledge and his life with us through grace. And in return, he shares our knowledge and our life with him. We become this new principle of love. We become a new foundation for our intellectual desiring, particularly our wondering, all the intellectual operations that constitute us as human beings, again, get reordered in such a way that they now point us in a much richer direction, and that is to see God in what it is that we're doing. So those of you who are familiar with the spirituality of St. Ignatius of Loyola, Loyola talks about how important it is to find God in all things. And I think one of the difficulties that we have in an academic setting is somehow to say, well, how can I find God in this biology book? How can I find God in this history? How can I find God in X? What I'd like to suggest is the experience of actually being loved by God in this profound way can open you up precisely the ways in which to find God in history books to find God in biology books, to find God in chemistry books. I'm not talking about Christian math, Christian chemistry, or any of that other stuff. What I am talking about is awakening in you a richer sense of wondering that there is a beauty and a depth of, uh, of truth here to be discovered, and that's what God is trying to communicate to all of us. The beauty that is God that gets manifested in the world and in the various kind of disciplines we find ourselves immersed in. I was listening to um, a radio show or NPR this few years ago, and they were interviewing a woman from the Rochester Institute of Technology whose um, discipline was pure mathematics. She worked in multi-dimensional geometries. Now, 
by and large, multi-dimensional geometries have has nothing to do with pragmatic existence, has very little to do with the concrete world in which we live. So the questioner asked her, well, why are you doing this? It doesn't seem to have any kind of pragmatic applications. Her response was, I do it because it's beautiful. And I'd like to suggest that she's put her finger on it. She has encountered something essential about who God is. The beauty that gets expressed through uncovering the wonder in the activity of the mind. That beauty is one of those important attributes that we can associate with God, that Augustine tells us in the Confessions. And that's for Augustine is the way in which he discovered who God is, is through the life of his own mind and being in contact with that which is beautiful. To talk about our friendship with God is to suggest that we engage God in terms of a amicus alter ipse, that is, another self. We encounter God as another us. And as another us, God is trying to get us to see and understand more about who God is. Again, from the Christian perspective, we think about the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And the union that can take place in our hearts through God's pouring His love in us. That we can begin to start thinking about our knowing, our doing, our teaching, our studying, as directed towards loving God even more. Just as you want to spend time with a friend. Because without spending time with friends, there's no way you can get to know that person. It seems odd to say this, but if you think about your intellectual life as an opportunity to spend time in conversation and friendship with God, there is going to be an opportunity for you to experience the richness and wonder of God and God's universe and all that God wants to bring about in this universe. In our desiring, in our wondering, if it gets transformed through this experience of converted love, then we become concerned with the good that God wants to bring about for us and the world in which we live. If we take seriously that the universe we live in is this, un is this unfolding dynamic set of events that is struggling to move towards its completion, and if we are men and women of faith, and we have to understand that God has a good that he wants to bring about for the unfolding of this cosmos. And to the degree in which we can somehow come to understand through our own intellectual lives what that good is, then we can help cooperate with the way in which God wants to help bring about this good. Not only are we concerned about the good of our own life, but the good of our own life then contributes to the good of the whole human drama that began when we first left the swamp. And it will continue until everything reaches its realization, as Paul says, in Christ. The intellectual life is that activity that can help us uncover what are those goods that God really wants to bring about in economics, in political philosophy, in law, in sociology, in literature, in music. In every discipline you study here at the university is an opportunity for you to encounter what God is trying to say to you in the depth of your heart about the good that can be realized or the good that will just bring you a sense of profound joy. It doesn't have to do anything more than that than bring you profound joy. You think about a profound work, a uh, piece of art, a painting. It doesn't have any practical purpose. What it can do, however, is transport you into a world that is completely foreign to you. It can transport you into a world that can open you up even more to the mystery that is God and what God wants for you and your life and the life of the world. We think about our intellectual life and the work that we do as students, think about it as a set of conversations with God. If it's true to say we are dialogical beings, then, at least in terms of what I'm trying to suggest, 
Our studying is a way in which engaging God in conversation. Asking God questions. Why this? Why that? What can I come to understand about who you are through this? What can I come to understand about the world in which I live that you want to bring about through this? It's a conversation that should be rooted in a form of conversion where we're interested in learning more and more about God and how God speaks to us through all of our studying and scholarly activities to help bring about the good that we should be and that the world wants to be. So the very eros of our minds, the desire to understand in this context of converted love seeks to articulate the goodness and intelligibility of the cosmos which is an expression of God's own love. Think about your love of learning, which is really a desire to know God. The eros that moves us is ultimately a desire to know God in the totality of who God is, which is wanting to know everything about everything. Those of you who are math majors, and this example actually uh, goes across disciplines, but math seems to be the easiest example. So you're trying to work through a problem. And all of a sudden, you have this aha moment, this insight where you think, I got it. I know how this is supposed to be. You verify it. You find out that's indeed the answer. That experience of the aha, of the insight, is the experience of God. Because it comes as a gift, and because Augustine tells us that our intellect is the created participation in the uncreated light. Those experiences of insights, those experiences of intellectual joy, are actual experiences of participating in the uncreated light that is God. They come as great gifts to open us up again to even more gifts, to help us move forward, to discover the ways in which our love of learning is truly a desire for God. The whole of our intellectual life, I want to suggest, ultimately, to think about it, is to be rooted in the absolute good, which is God. But also out of that, then, is to think about the goods that God wants to bring about for the world. Again, economics, science, political philosophy, mathematics, law, religion, all these other sorts of disciplines are all opportunities to have a conversation with God and to think about these goods that God would like to help bring about. We are dialogical beings rooted, from the Christian perspective, in the eternal word made flesh. Again, for the Christians out here, think about the beginning of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the word, all right, logos. John is telling us that Jesus is God's divine conversation to us in history. Logos also means reason. So. We can think about Jesus as God's divine conversation to us in history and a manifestation of God's own self-understanding in the person of Christ. To participate then in the uncreated light, at least from the Christian perspective, is to fall in love with Jesus as the Word made flesh, as the speech of God, as the act of God's self-understanding. Friendship then with God in the intellectual life is a discerning process of how God is calling us to the fullness of human living. One of the early church um, fathers in the Christian tradition, uh, St. Irenaeus, had this wonderful saying, something along the lines of, God's glory manifests itself most fully in a man or woman completely alive. And what St. Irenaeus is trying to get at is that the glory of God shines most profoundly in every man and woman who is trying to live his or her life authentically. And from my, my perspective, that means then to the degree that you let your intellectual life unfold in such a way that you can see God's glory being manifested in the very work that you do in the act of studying, manifest the fact that you yourself are trying to live a full and authentic human life. We think about friendship with God as a form of conversation. 
One of the other aspects of this conversation is that it takes place in the context of a community. Yes, there's times for private prayer, but there's also the communal aspect of your faith commitment. Uh, mass or uh, temple, whatever that communal expression is, is an opportunity for you to encounter God in a conversational way. And the conversation, again, as I said, is the sweep of the whole history of your tradition. So even, let's say you're a Catholic and you're at Mass, you are present not only with the other men and women who are there with you, but you are present to every man and woman who ever went before you. You've been drawn up into this tremendous historical conversation about who God is and what God wants us to be. To think about our relationship then in a community is to think about our relationship in terms of a church. Part of the conversation then that we need to be part of is the conversation of the church. So when we hear things about doctrines or morals, what we're really talking about are speech acts. That the Christian church has constituted sets of meanings through these kinds of acts that help tell us how to understand ourselves in this world. So the church is a communicative body. It was constituted in communication from Christ to the early Christians. And one of the important functions of the church, then, is to engage us in conversation around those important constitutive components that help us understand why we are as we are. So that means that, say you're interested in theology, so that means that you take seriously the theoretical aspects of what doctrine entails. That it's just not about formulas that says, the Nicene Council says, homoousion, the God-man, one substance, other those sorts of things, that you begin to immerse yourself in a kind of intellectual exploration to enrich your own faith and your own understanding of what it is God has given you. So the ecclesial conversation then becomes significant because it's a conversation that God is having with us, again, through the sacramental life of the church, if you're a Christian, through other forms of worship and other religious denominations, the communion of saints, as I've talked about, Again, all mediated in a, in a way in which to help us come to a greater understanding of ourselves and our relationship with God. I have more than, on more than one occasion, been fortunate enough to have that experience that I had in Spokane, Washington, repeated. And to me, it is a great gift that the grace that God gives in those kinds of moments of actually f falling more deeply in love with what I do intellectually reinforces for me even more the choices that I've made along my, uh, along my life. Uh, as some of you know, the choices have oftentimes been in zigzagging aspects. Uh, <clears throat> but to find myself doing what I'm doing in terms of philosophy, working with students, for me personally, has been a profound experience of this kind of conversational understanding of the intellectual life with God and what God is asking. So let me just conclude by um, suggesting then that the intellectual life in the context of friendship with God underscores the fundamental point that God's conversational self-presence to us is personal, it's communal, and it's a process of self-mediation, whereby in this conversation we come to understand more about ourselves, about the world in which we live, and the good that God wants to bring about for that world. We get caught up in the divine conversation, and this divine conversation is a conversation that places us in history. My wife is giving me the sign. I was getting too low. <laughs> this divine conversation places us in history, Again, the history that has unfolded eons ago and a history that will continue to unfold until it all somehow is realized in Christ and what that means. 
To call ourselves self-mediated creatures is to talk about the ways in which, in this case, the intellectual life can mediate our self-understanding through our conversation with God in the work that we do, in studying, etc. Our self-meaning then becomes a function, not just in terms of the choices I make, but it's also in terms of what I learn, what I learn about the various disciplines I find myself in, and then again, that gets taken up in the context of the mystical body. As we study, as we think, as we pray, all of these activities are drawing us deeper into God who wants to say, this is who I am, this is what I'd like you to pay attention to, this is how I love you, and this is what I want you to be, and this is what I want the world to be. If we can think about our life in that context, then perhaps some 8 o'clock classes will, won't be so death-dealing. And maybe some of those courses that we have to take may be a glimmer of hope in terms of perhaps encountering something new about God and who we are in our lives. Because I think the mark of someone who is truly intellectually converted is being able to sit in a class that he or she has to take to fulfill core but making the judgment that there is something here to discover about who I am and about what God is trying to communicate to me. It may be difficult, it may only happen one day in the semester, but it's well worth the struggle. Uh, I can only tell you from my own experience that it's been a great gift for me to be able to, th to think about it this way, to be able to teach philosophy, to have those kinds of experiences, and uh, but it's not just something that I can have. I argue that it's something open to all of you. Thank you.